All right, good evening. Um, it is February 12th. I'd like to call the facilities meeting to order. Is there any public comment on tonight's agenda? All right, seeing none, I will turn it over to Mr. Lally. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Petruno. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to start by just thanking my fellow administrators for allowing me to go on and kind of hijack your meeting here this evening. I apologize, but um, I think I tried to provide the board with enough information prior to the meeting um, that this would not be very long. So in brief, uh, we opened the bids for the uh, Colonial Elementary School renovation, and our budgeted number for the project was actually $18,479,810 and our actual numbers came in at $17,856.80 for a cost difference between our budget and the actuals of $623,730. Um, $623, so again, I'm very happy with the bid opening. We had um, six general contractors, we had eight mechanical contractors, we had four plumbers, and we had three electricians. So um, again, the turnout was great, but I think what was even more um, amazing of the actual bid was how close our numbers were. Um, the two GCs were uh, in over $8 million were in their base bid around $26,000 $26, apart. And it was either their base or with the alternates. So what I wanted to just let the board know is we did, uh, along the process here, we did talk about there are 10 alternates um, that we wanted to actually put into the project. And they are actually included in that number that still has us lower than the budget. So we would, again, look for the board's recommendation uh, approval for doing all of those alternates at the same time we're doing the project because it, it does keep us on budget. And then lastly, I think it's important to know that um, we are doing five capital projects in this project that were listed in the five-year capital improvement that were roughly around a million dollars. So HVAC for the gym, HVAC for the auditorium, the emergency generator, the electronic sign outside, and there's one other where um, all things that were identified in the five-year capital that we thought would be better to see if we could do them within the budget of this project and you know not cause double work and possibly get us a better number because we would be mobilized and already performing the work. So uh, we're going to recommend that we go with uh, everything that we proposed, every alternate. And again, those jobs that we just named were already projects that were approved to be in the five-year capital and done with that, those funds. So again, I don't know um, as far as the bid opening itself that I experienced one that was this close um, and at those numbers. Um, so again, that's a credit to, I think, uh, GKO um, and as small and as low down as like Jim Lyons, our, our custodian on site, that walked a lot of people through the building that wanted to see every crack and crevice and when I couldn't get to them. So um, again, it really is a team effort with everybody getting on board so that we could get some some accurate numbers. Questions? Oh, sorry. Um, Thank you so much to you, your team, to everyone for their um, support in this. I just have like a very general question. So when I was looking at the comparisons um, in terms of the other uh, companies, uh, specifically for general construction, I guess my wondering is, for, for example, security film, mm -hmm. what, would, what would cause a company to say $34,000 versus, you know, the other four companies were averaging somewhere between like five to eight. So I guess I'm just trying to understand like where are the, why are there so many large discrepancies on some of these things? Um, and do we, do we know why? Great question. Uh, I think there's several answers, but one of the answers that I would think that applies most is sometimes you can see it in the electrical bids um, where there's that, there's our greatest discrepancy is there where they may use a subcontractor to do their like medium voltage work and the contractor that was low bid does their medium voltage work themselves. So they're not getting someone else's price to actually perform or do the installation of that work. 
So I think that's generally, um, and then a lot of times it can just be how busy someone is, right? Um, people want the work, but they want the work at their price. Um, and if they're already busy, that's why you want hope for competitive bidding. Um, but I think in that situation with the film, in my opinion, it would be more because someone's seeking to go outside and do that work for them. All right, thank you. I was just curious. You're welcome. Um, I know that you sort of put it out to us, but can you just talk about the people um, that we are looking to approve um, and the projects they've already done in the district? Sure. Because I think, is it everybody that's already done work for us previously? Correct. Uh, I'll start with Myco Mechanical. Uh, they won the plumbing. They are the low bid for plumbing and uh, mechanical. They just recently finished the middle school. So they were their contractor on the middle school. Um, Myco did the renovation at PW. Uh, Myco did the air conditioning in all the elementary schools. And we did that in 17. And Myco also uh, just recently won off of the five-year pro uh, capital project. They won the bid for the chiller replacement at PW Science Wing. So mechanically, we're very satisfied with Myco and their plumbing. Um, Walter Brooker and Company has been doing work in Colonial, um, three generation company. Uh, Kyle is the youngest now, but when I started, the father was working here and they were doing the windows at Plymouth White Marsh. Um, so they've done uh, large projects like that. They did the project here when we did all the classrooms and the doors and we set them back and we redid the carpeting. Um, they've also done work in all the elementary schools in 2017 when we did all the new windows there. So when we put all the air conditioning in the elementaries, we put new windows in. So they're very familiar with us. And BSI <clears throat> has done our line voltage work um, at the middle school. They've done our, all our medium voltage work here to this property. They're very familiar. Plus, we use them as an emergency uh, contractor for us. So when there's a power outage that's not a PICO issue, um, BSI has always been our standby um, contractor. All right, thank you. So not only were they the lowest bids that came in, but good reputation. You, uh, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you I'm still in shock. It worked out great. It really did. Now we just got to get it done, right? So yeah, can you talk about next steps a little bit? Because I know we're on a tight timeline. Sure. So um, Joe Mesmer, who's in the back of the room from GKO, and um, with him is Bill Slaughter. Um, and he's from ICS. And I'll talk about Bill in a moment. But uh, so the next steps were uh, what GKO does is we, they have what they call a de-scoping meeting. So we met with all the contractors on Friday that were the apparent low bids and basically just had them sign off that they received all the addendums. There's nothing that they're aware of that would change their number. And it was basically just a, a, you know, a meeting to kind of figure out, you know, there's going to be no surprises now that you're low bid. Um, and it went very well. I've honestly never gone through that process before, but it will be one we use moving forward because I really liked it. It gave us an opportunity to, to just let the contractors know our expectations. So next step is um, with board approval, you know, we work through Mark's office and GKO's office with all the contractors to get our contracts together. And hopefully we want to be mobilized by March 25th. Okay, so then we would recommend that this moves to Thursday night's meeting to be voted on? Yes, okay. correct. All right. Anybody have any other questions for Joe? Joe, thanks so much for you know being willing to give us all this information ahead of time so that we could look it over. I think that was super helpful. You're welcome. Thank you. And and lastly, just we do have some project management in the in the actual number, which is in the budget. Um, and that's where Mr. Slaughter in the back, if you raise your hand, please. He's from ICS. They're very familiar with school district work and have done work in a lot of different school districts. Um, they were gracious enough to work a number that would kind of be flexible around Colonial um, that would allow me the opportunity to still do my thing but not have the responsibility to be here every second of every day because it wouldn't be practical. So um, some of you may be familiar with the term clerk of the works and then full-blown project manager. I think it's safe to say we're somewhere in the middle. So at the same time, we'll be looking to approve um, ICS on Thursday, too, as the project manager. But again, they're all in the budget.
So that'll be a separate line item. It'll be a separate. It's it's in a, it's a separate line item, but it's in our right. twenty one million. Okay. Yes. Sorry, just to add to that, and I apologize, I missed your name, Mr. Bill Slaughter. Slaughter, Mr. Slaughter. So will Mr. Slaughter be available at meetings when we have questions, like as if we have meetings, that, if we have questions, yes, he'll he'll be available. Okay. But more importantly, someone will be on site um, right. every day. Of course. So thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay. Again, I know I've said it a million times. Please call, text, email. You won't offend me anytime. If you have questions, I know they pop up at weird times. I'm good with it. Um, just want to make sure everybody's comfortable because we are moving really fast. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, anything else for this evening, Mr. Lally? Nothing. All right. Any public comments on tonight's agenda? All right, seeing none, this meeting is adjourned and we will move on to curriculum. Thank you. Yeah, I thought that was my logo. Are you good? Okay. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, calling the curriculum committee meeting of the board uh, to order. Are there any comments on tonight's agenda? Seeing none, I'm going to pass it over to Mrs. Gurgaitis. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marino, and welcome, everybody. Good evening. We do have a few uh, items on our agenda for this evening. We are going to talk about uh, SEALS standards, science, technology, and engineering, environmental literacy, and sustainability. We are also going to talk about our summer programming. Um, for this summer. We're going to give you a little bit of a preview with that. We have two issue briefs to go over this evening, one for AP World History and one for AP African American Studies, Phase 2. And we have one conference request for you this evening. So I am going to hand it over to Mrs. Wilichek and her special guests. Thank you so much. Good evening, members of the board, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you tonight about science. So I don't very often get to wear my science hat when I come to these meetings. And those of you that know me well know that I like to geek out on the topic as much as I possibly can. So this is my time to shine. For those of you that are new that do not know me, I am Maria Wilicek. I am the science curriculum supervisor here for the district. And this is my 15th year here. Prior to coming to Colonial, I was at Upper Darby where I was a biology teacher for several years and taught many different other science electives at high school. Uh, and then became an assistant principal and then moved on to my role here. So I have a long history in science, and I'm glad that I was able, after going into administration, to be able to come back and have my focus still be on science. And so this is something that I'm very passionate about. And I'm actually very excited that the state has moved in a direction to shift what the standards are uh, currently to something that is more streamlined with what the rest of the country is doing. So I'm going to walk you in, in addition with Dr. Brett Criswell, who's here with me tonight, and I'll introduce him in a second, through four main points about what SEALS is and what we're doing as a district in order to prepare ourselves and our students for these shifts. Um, and then propose to you at the end, something called a lighthouse district, which we're very excited about. So again, introduction, this is Dr. Brett Criswell. He is currently a professor at Westchester University, uh, but he has a lot of history as far as the standards for science in the state of Pennsylvania. He was one of the original teachers that helped to write the standards for science in PA back in 2002. He then moved on to Kentucky where he taught chemistry, right? No? Education. Science education, chemistry at the University of Kentucky as well. And he also worked with the Next Generation Science Standard, um, which came out in 2012, but Pennsylvania didn't really adopt. But he has a lot of familiarity with them. And now he is helping Pennsylvania and the team here in developing the SEAL standard. So, uh, Dr. Crystal, do you want to add anything? Um, that uh, yeah, I think. I don't know how much attention you paid to Oh, sorry. I don't know how much attention you paid to standards and the battles over standards. Um, but I, I, Maria mentioned I was on the 2001 group that created the 2002 standards. I was one of only two practicing teachers on a committee of 15 people. Um, that was discouraging to begin with. And then what was created was even more discouraging. And in fact, I want, really wanted to have my name erased from involvement in that. Uh, and then to see Pennsylvania continue with those standards for, you know, they, they rewrote them in 2010, but they were really not that much different. 
Uh, and so 20 years of bad standards, and finally Pennsylvania has adopted a set of standards which are good and will take the state in the good direction in science. And I just want to say this, Maria's leadership in this district, because I'm working across the state, and most schools are saying, oh, we don't have to do this until 2025. She's been leading the district and doing this now, and that's why we're coming to you to talk to you with this, about this lighthouse school notion, because we need districts who are taking the lead on this to really show the rest of the state how to do it. So let's talk about that a little bit. So next generation science standards, you might have seen NGSS written before, uh, bless you. So next generation science standards came about, actually I'm getting ahead of myself, but correlation between next generation science standards and the steel. So next generation, or PA science, science standards were implemented before I, or after I started. I was so young, but I did start teaching in the 90s. And then in 2002, they implemented, PA implemented science and those standards really, as, as was mentioned, have not changed since 2002. So over 20 years of having the same standards where core or ELA and math has changed, we've made no changes in science, even though science is based upon advances in technology and knowledge, yet we're working with the same set of standards that. Um, and so the next generation standards came about in 2012, and they weren't necessarily adopted across the whole entire country. A lot of states took those standards and implemented them as they wanted to and adopted forms of them within their states. But there's over 20 states right now in the country that fully embrace the next generation science standards. And then there's an additional almost 20, I think, that takes some iteration of. So SEALs is Pennsylvania's version of it because we have to take, we can't adopt any. That's what we do today. But our version of them, which are really closely aligned to next generation science standards, and some teachers might not tell you they're excited for it change is hard to embrace, but I will say that I think it is in the best interest of science. And what it means is having a new vision for science. So you'll see there's a column on the left and the right. And what this is, is a, it's a summary of a document that the state has put out that's been out for everybody to kind of review. But think back to when you were in a science class, whatever class you might have had, whether it was middle school or high school, and think about how you learn science. There's a lot of terms. I was a former biology. They say teaching biology is like teaching a foreign language. There's so much vocab. But science is not about the terminology. Science is about the doing and the applying. And so if you did not have to learn all of those words and you actually were doing the application, that's what we want science to be about. It should be about the concepts first, about the applications, about solving problems, not about terminology. It's making students being active learners as opposed to being passive. It's getting them to drive questions that they want as opposed to sitting there and doing wet worksheets and being Client. So that's really the shift. And we've always tried to embrace that to some extent, but now we're going to be taking a different approach, having some structure to what our curriculum and our instruction looks like, and that's what we're going to lay out for you today. So the two main concepts that I want to point out that are different, especially in SEALs, but with next generation science standards, is teaching from a viewpoint of phenomena, as well as using 3D science in our instruction. Now, I don't know what those of you that were here before, back in like 2017, we did a whole presentation on 3D science. Chris Baranza came because we had a gentleman named Brett Molding come and do some professional development with us, specifically on phenomena uh, and 3D science. And it was a new concept and it was a lot to grasp, but we've been doing this work actually for quite some time. The pandemic kind of put a little bit of a kink in our work, but our teachers have been getting familiarity with this for a while. So I want to explain um, some importance of phenomena in 3D learning and show you how that's going to make some, help make some shifts in some of the instruction that we do. This is, you might need to speak. You might need the mic. Do if I do it like this? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. I hate being tethered to. That's okay. That's okay. I can do it. Thank you, though. Check one. I'm just so used to Check. like being able to move around. Hello? Hello? All right, cool. Um, so this is a picture from a place near here. I don't know if anybody's been to uh, Upper Black Eddy PA, the state park that's there. This is actually a picture from it. And I want to ask you to look at that picture and do what you would have done when you're maybe six, seven, eight years old. Just ask questions, right? Like that's we're driven at that age to learn. We want to know, we want to understand, we want to make sense of things around. So what questions do you have looking at this picture from a nearby state park? Okay. <laughs> um, 
how did the rocks get to be so jagged? Why are they that color? Um, why is there such a stark contrast between the green and the um, sort of ashy color on the, on the bottom? Wow, that's awesome. You, you were the one that said wanderings earlier when you were talking. <laughs> and, and, I, and I, mentioned I do that. like the word wanderings, yes. That's a great word, because that's what it is, right? <laughs> You're wondering why are the rocks jagged? Why right. are they um, with color, the coloration? Yeah. The way they're, and, and that thing about that, that's what drives children, and they have that curiosity. And somehow between that and you know, elementary school, middle school, secondary, we, we take that away. And the standards are trying to get that. And so we start with what it is that science does. Look at this. Why are the rocks jagged? The question that uh, a lot of people asked is, why is this big field of rocks at the end of it? Otherwise, it's just forced there. Why is there this big field of rocks? And so that's what scientists do. We ask questions, and that's where it starts. And so in our classes, students asking questions, and, and be driven, as Maria said a few minutes ago, by asking those questions. So we could ask questions about that, and we can answer, we can answer that question of how we get there, and we can have our students think about how to answer that. Uh, a little, be, little bit of a deeper dive into this. I didn't give you the name of the park yet. We're going to do it. Um, Ooh, this is ow. me at the park. I'm sorry. <laughs> so don't right. make any comments. <laughs> Talented music. Okay. All right. <laughs> I gave up the music for teaching science. You, you said, oh, you, you recognize this. Can you tell me? I have a, um, little videos of kids especially like wanting to. Is it tell, ring, like Ringing Rock? Yeah, it's, it's called yeah. Ringing Rock State Park. And it's because the rocks have this unique quality that aren't, don't, aren't rocks everywhere that do this. They actually, when you hit them with a hammer, they have a, a kind of musical sound to them. And so, of course, the question we ask is, how does that happen? And science doesn't just ask, ask questions. Science tries to explain the questions. And starting with phenomena like this is then engaging students in what scientists really do. How do these rocks make those sounds? And why are the rocks here in this particular field the ones that do that? Why do rocks not in other places don't do that? You know, so that's what we're trying to start with. But that's different. It's different for teachers to start there and start with the terms and the worksheets and things and the notes. So it takes teachers, it's going to take teachers a different approach to this. And I want to just kind of allude to what we're getting at the Lighthouse School. Teachers are asking, what does it look like to teach like this? Because this is not how we taught. And your teachers are bought into teaching like this. And in, the, in a nutshell, the idea of a Lighthouse School is they will be models to show other people this is how it's done. And that's such an invaluable thing for our state. Okay. So as you can see, phenomena makes it exciting for kids, but there's also two other really important pieces of why we want to use phenomena in our instruction. So one is that by introducing phenomena, just as you demonstrate it, it allows you to come up with questions. And that then will make the teacher want to investigate the questions that were generated by the student. Not the teacher posing the question for the kid, but because of student interest and what they are curious about, that will create the storyline of where the unit that they're teaching is going to go. The other piece that's really nice about phenomena, it gives a level of equity. It gives all students the opportunity to access the curriculum. So it's not necessarily about experience. We're looking for phenomena that nobody has the answer to. It doesn't matter if you go to the beach in the summertime. It doesn't matter if you've had a certain experience at the zoo. We're looking at things that nobody really knows the answer to. And unless we talk it out and give all of our ideas and every idea being valid, then it makes it a very worthwhile learning experience. So it really levels the playing field for all students. So those two things are key. And then once students feel as though they can access that curriculum and that their voice or their questions or their ideas are of value or contributing, it really helps them to engage in the learning experience. This was you too. So I'm doing a presentation um, at the Extra Learning Opportunities we're okay. good. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> moving all over the place, Bobby. <laughs> Actually, learning opportunities uh, conference uh, at the end of the month, and the title of it is "It Takes a Village to Implement These Standards." And you're gonna get like the three-minute version of what I'm gonna talk about. And what, why I want to mention that to you is because it can't be just Maria. It can't be just the science teachers to understand what's special and new about these new standards. Other people have to understand it because that's the only way the support is going to be there across the state and make it a community-wide effort. 
great changes to the place we want to have. So this is a, a video of Chris. a woman. Her name is Susan Berry. She's a scientist, but she's actually talking about her experience as a learner in this video. And I, it's, I'm just going to play a minute clip for it, and it's, it's a metaphor for the most important thing, the only thing, really, I want people to understand about the new standards that makes them special. It's a metaphor for that. So, can you see the video? Yep. When I was in my 20s and 30s, my eyes looked relatively straight because of the surgeries that I had, and I read well, although I read slowly. But as I got older, my vision became jittery. So I went to see a developmental optometrist. Our initial goal was just to stabilize my gaze. The most important ability that I learned was how to point the two eyes at the same place at the same time. I used the Brock string, I used polarized vectograms, and I used devices like the Marsden ball. And suddenly, I'm jumping on a trampoline. And to my astonishment, along the way, I began to see in 3D. That experience was unbelievably joyful. It was like this revelation. It was a late winter day, you know, when the snowflakes are really big and gloppy. I could see the palpable pockets of space between the different snowflakes, and it was like this beautiful three-dimensional dance. Light fixtures seemed to be floating. Sea faucets would jut out toward me. I could see the space between leaves on a tree, and I would go inside these spaces just to experience that sense of immersion. And this was among the most empowering, liberating experiences of my life. It changed. So um, I don't know if you caught what she was talking about, but she, had, she was cross-eyed, so she grew up cross-eyed, and she had had some surgeries, but they stopped being effective. So she tried to physically train her eyes, and what made her able to, so if you're not familiar with being cross-eyed, not see three-dimensionally, you see things flat, three-dimensional, kind of image in front of you. What made her able to see three-dimensionally was learning how to take her eyes and focus two eyes on the same thing at the same time to get the brain the information it needs to construct that three-dimensional image. And, and I hope you heard her words at the end. When she did that, she said it was one. This is the principle underlying the new standards, that we need to take three different things, direct them to the same learning experiences at the same time, and in the same way, our kids have the kind of enriching experiences that are possible. We give them the phenomenon, and we give them the opportunity to learn the way science is. So Marie's going to talk about, talk about three dimensions of NGSS. Yeah. So this is also something that we've been working with for quite some time, but standards now for science are not going to be one or linear version, so to speak, of science about concepts. They're actually going to be three-dimensional. And these are the three dimensions, and I apologize for being so small, but this is as big as I could possibly make it. They're still disciplinary core ideas. Those are your standard science ideas, physical science, life science, earth and space science. But in addition to that, we have two other prongs that we have to overlay. We have to overlay science and engineering practices, as well as cross-cutting concepts. The science and engineering practices kind of are very similar to your scientific method, as well as your engineering and design process. And then the cross-cutting concepts are themes that we see throughout science, regardless of the specific content. So you will always see patterns. You'll always see cause and effect. You'll always see models. You'll see matter and energy transfer, whether it's life science, physical science, or earth science but making those connections for kids so that they understand how the science is relevant to them and their real life. So that they, when they leave the classroom, they can make and apply these connections to other things that they're experiencing, whether it's about their, their medical conditions of family members, whether it's about what's going on in their environment or their community, and they can make sound choices because they have the knowledge to apply all three of these simultaneously. So here's the thing, as we mentioned before, it's a shift in instruction. What does that look like? How do teachers have to adjust to this? And what does it mean for students? The 3D component, it makes connections between the concepts across all the disciplines. Students see the big picture, they understand how science affects them, the world around them. It's also going to make the students be more engaged. They can employ real world problems to these situations hopefully much easier, and tying in that phenomena piece makes it that much more relevant. Their questions are what drive our instruction. So we're taking their questions and we're figuring out then what's the next piece to go from there to make sure that we're, we're teaching these concepts in a way that's motivating for them and makes them all want to participate. And lastly, the way that we're assessing the kids also has to change. We cannot just give these linear tests that are recall questions about terminologies. 
We're looking at things like scenarios and taking the knowledge that you learned in class and applying it to a different scenario. Not just a straight up laboratory investigation where we're looking for specific results or where we're looking for vocab terms. So teachers need to be well trained on all of this to be able to deliver the science content in a different fashion. So I want to share with you just some of the work that we've been doing, what the rollout looks like, because this is going to have an impact on our curriculum cycle, on our budget, and what our PD schedule looks like. So what does it mean for CSD? Well, this is the curriculum cycle. Hopefully you've seen this at some point in time. And we've already been doing a lot of work I'm going to show you in a second. But I wanted to point out for you that state assessments are changing. PSSA will be changing and the Keystone will be changing. And that's going to be happening in 2024. We're going to be looking at field tests. So this school year, no, I'm sorry, the start of next school year, we're going to be having field tests. In particular, the fourth grade PSSA that we currently have is going to move to fifth grade. And we'll have a field test in fifth grade there. And we also are going to be having changes made on the eighth grade assessment, as well as our biology is going to be a more scenario-based test. It's not going to be like it is now. And our teachers are already preparing for this. Also know that I've been working with Linkit. They've been phenomenal because Linkit also works with New Jersey. New Jersey has also adopted Next Generation Science Standards. And they've given us field tests that they've created that are similar to what the state is going to be modeling for their test, which has been very helpful for teachers. And so we're using PLT time right now to look at what those assessments look like so we can start developing some of our own questions to help our kids prepare for the changes that are coming to the state assessment. Uh, our goal for what we're trying to do as a district is we want to change the student experience that kids really get a more holistic approach to science. We're gonna have vertical articulation so that K through 12, that curriculum is going to spiral with content and we're going to be changing our assessments. So those are our three main things that our teachers are going to be working on as we do our professional development. Just to give you a quick timeline, we actually started this work in 2017. I don't know if you remember, but we actually did a major gap analysis with next generation science standards. We didn't even look at the Pennsylvania science standards because we knew that this change was going to be coming and we wanted to look at the units of study that we had, specifically K through five, to find where the gaps are of what we were not teaching. And so right before the pandemic, we started a five-year rollout of units uh, that we were going to have fully imp implemented by 2021. And actually the pandemic helped us because when we closed down, a lot of the things that we were planning to do, we could not do when we were home. And so we had to find other resources out there and trying to do activities and videos and many things became free. And so we were kind of able to pilot a lot of different things uh, that were out there. So we were able to complete our rollout of the units and the content specific right when we were coming back from the pandemic. And so now, believe it or not, our full K-5 curriculum is already fully aligned to what the field standards are. So we're in really good shape for that. Um, and I actually think the teachers are, are doing a great job with it. We need to do more with some assessments, but they're enjoying what they're doing, and I think the kids are enjoying it too. So we're very proud about that. Um, last year, we started looking at the, the SEALS hub. It became available to the public in the spring, and luckily, uh, I'm a member of what is called Pencil, which is it's a, a group across the state of some administrators and teachers that are working specifically in preparing for their districts for adopting these steel standards. So that's given me a little bit of a leg up to get some of this information sooner than later and then bring it to the teachers. But our focus last year was really on focusing on phenomena. So we've been doing that. And this year we're continuing, we're working with Dr. Criswell. We're focusing on 3D science in particular, what that means for our instruction and we're starting curriculum cycle. So physics and chemistry are working on curriculum cycle this year and we're looking to identify core resources as well to support that. And we're also gonna be starting what's called the Lighthouse um, Program, which we'll share in a second. Next year, we're going to be focusing on, I'm sorry, we're also focusing on sixth grade curriculum. So the start of next school year, those three, sixth grade, physics, and chemistry will all be new. The following year, we're going to be focusing our curriculum writing on writing seventh grade curriculum and biology. And so the following year, those will be new and we'll be continuing with our lighthouse. And lastly, we'll have eighth grade curriculum at the middle school to roll out so that we should hopefully have full vertical articulation. That's our plan. And now we want to share with you the Lighthouse program. This is the last piece, uh, but this is what's going to set us apart and help us to be a leader in science in the state of Pennsylvania. So the Lighthouse model, there is a, an issue brief that does go along with this, which is linked there if you want to look at it. We're going to be working very closely under Dr. Chris Wells' guidance, but most of the work will be done during PLT and professional development, focusing on our vertical articulation, our summative assessments, our formative assessments, and what the application of the practices look like with 3D instruction. Do you want to elaborate anything on that or? Uh, I think that's all I have. 
<laughs> so if I could just bring this home. And I know we've talked at you for a while. So I want to say the take-home message to you about this. Um, it was a painful thing getting my PhD. I'm, and I got it to be in the space to do stuff like this. I was in Kentucky when they rolled out their new standards. And I, and I worked there to help them. They had a wonderful plan in place and was very successful. Pennsylvania, you might not be surprised, does not have as good a plan. Um, and so this lighthouse model was part of the original plan, but we haven't been putting it forth the way we want to. And I, when Maria came to me and asked me to come to the school, and when I started working with the teachers, I saw the potential for, for this school district to be that. And I think you have to appreciate the importance of this. So I have my shirt <laughs> for this occasion. <laughs> I had my niece make this because I really believe this. This is an amazing opportunity in the state to take science where we, we all want. We, want. we want to enjoy science. We want to learn. We want to prepare scientists. But not just that, we want to prepare students who understand science issues. We haven't been doing that. So to be able to do that, we need models of what that looks like. And so in, the, in a nutshell, of the idea of the Lighthouse School is to say, I believe with Maria's leadership, with your support, the teachers here can show other teachers in this area and across the state what it looks like to do good PA skills teaching. And we're going to work together to make that happen. So that's what the Lighthouse is. Thank you for listening to us and having a chance. Any questions, Any questions for us? Yeah. Um, so this is amazing. Like, I, I'm, I'm really excited for, for this. Um, I just wonder with, like, at the high school level when you get into AP, mm -hmm. right? Because that's a curriculum that we don't have as much control we over. We don't have any control over AP. Well, I was trying to be a little yeah. bit <laughs> positive with my spin there. Um, how will those students be kind of left out of this while they're in those courses? Or I can answer that in two ways for you. First, the steel standards are for all students. So this is what everybody has to be able to do. AP goes beyond those. And so it doesn't in any way interfere with what AP teachers do. But and another way of looking at it is AP. I, when I was a high school teacher, I refused to teach AP because it was problem solving, memorization. AP has changed to be much more conceptually oriented and based. And so this will actually better prepare students for your AP courses. So it doesn't affect them in terms of standards because AP are beyond these standards. But it does affect the terms of uh, is that so? And when we teach AP, if you're thinking about how are these standards going to be aligned, like in the coursework, if we're creating curriculum, we don't necessarily use these standards when we create an AP course. The college board creates right. what the curriculum is. We're not changing that. But the skills that the kids are going to learn by going through this curriculum, starting at kindergarten, that 3D practice, having the, the cross cutting concepts, the knowledge behind that makes it so much more. The, the ability for them to apply the knowledge at a higher level, hopefully, will make them more readily able to do it. I think if, if the district really does this, the students will do better in AP. And because of how AP has changed itself, the, they've, they've tried to model themselves more after the NGS. Great. I was wondering, do we have any data on how, or, or any outlook on how these uh, standards will help with um, employment? Because I'm thinking if the if this aligns with the new sta uh, generation science centers, aligns with what we have with going with the tech schools, these same concepts and skills with the students who are in the tech schools and, and going into the trades, will these same sort of concepts help them as they're going into the workforce as well? Do we have any data or suggestions on how that can help them? I think what you should understand is the NGSS was created by multi-member teams that had representatives from teachers, administrators, industry. So industry had input in these standards saying, what do we, and, and, they, and they value the science engineering practices, all the communication skills, thinking skills, problem solving skills. So I, I, well, I, don't, I don't know that anybody's really collected data on how this prepares them, but industry was at the table to make sure the standards were what they wanted to see happen for people to come out of those ready to be in them. Okay. Um, with this transition, um, what does it look like from um, 
the perspective of materials or learning spaces and, and budgeting? Like, how does that? Well, I mean, it's part of our curriculum cycle. So we're already budgeting for making shifts in the curriculum over the next couple of years. And, we, and we've looked at it in such a way so we're not doing everything all at once. We're kind of staggering it, especially at the middle school level. That's probably where we're going to see our biggest change, because in order to do this right, we really need an integrated approach to science. So that means that currently the way middle school is taught, we have mostly physical science in sixth grade. We have life science in seventh grade and earth and space in eighth. We need to do a little bit of each in each grade so that the curriculum really spirals and the kids are not learning it all at one grade in sixth grade and then they don't have any of it again until they get to the high school. That integration, that's the change. But we're doing one year at a time so that the students have no gap in the content as it rolls out. As far as the, the materials and things, again, K-5, we're already fully aligned. So we've already been paying for the consumables and the kids, the, the awesome thing about the K-5 is that it is so activity-based. Those kids are doing hands-on activities almost every single lesson. And so we do have a model in place where we can get those consumables and, and a lot of the stuff is also online, which makes it a little bit less expensive. Um, and then as far as the rest of them are concerned, I mean, we're just budgeting through. We're, we're right now in the process of looking at core materials. So we're kind of, we have a rubric that is from Ed Reports to determine you know, what's valid and what's not valid so that we make a wise choice, but we're not really anticipating any major shifts in budget from what we're already currently doing. You have a question? Um, I have a couple quick questions. So I, I know when the um, Common Core Standards came out <laughs> and your point in the beginning around the National does one thing and then Pennsylvania does another thing, <laughs> So can you just talk a little bit around what, in your opinion, are the major differences between what Pennsylvania has adopted versus what else is happening? So in science, there's no difference. The Pennsylvania science standards are the next generation science standards. They're organized in a way that's harder to find things. So I'm helping them locate things. So that wasn't a good move. But they are the standards. Okay. The um, engineering, technology, and environmental literacy were written by, in Pennsylvania to mimic the structure you know, the three-dimensional nature of those standards. And so really what we've, they, Pennsylvania's done is tack on these other two engines. That's using that framework. So. Okay, so that won't limit us in any way when we're looking at core materials or things along those lines. All right. Um, and then you talk a lot around spiraling, and um, so I would love if you could explain that a little bit more for, um, for everyone's sake, just to make sure we're on the same page. And um, just to make sure that, I'm understanding it correctly. We're talking, this is a really strong vertical alignment. It's not necessarily, we're looking for mastery at end of grade level. We're looking for this spiraled integration um, as we continue to scaffold up. Is that correct? When districts have asked me how to approach this, I say the number one thing is to get vertical alignment. Because the standards are built that you'll do something in second grade, and then in eighth grade, you'll add the next layer on top of that. In 11th grade, you'll add another layer on top of that. And so if you don't have that, and they don't do in second grade what they need to do. In eighth grade, they're behind. In eleventh grade, there have never been standards. Pennsylvania's old standards weren't written that such that the standards truly built off of each other across. Them. So that vertical line is really going to be quick, which is talking to build. Yep, it's great. Um, last question is more of a district question. So in terms of communication with families. Um, around shifts, around changes, around what to expect. Could you just talk a little bit around what have we already communicated, what's coming, just to make sure that you know our families are, are clearly in the loop? At the K-5 level, honest, there was a communication that went out back in 2017, to be honest with you, when we first started doing this. And so nothing is really, we haven't changed, we've been working towards that. So I haven't sent any more communication out since then. Um, as far as middle and high school, because we haven't really started with the changes, we haven't done anything quite yet, but that's something that will be forthcoming. Um, I think that that's something that the team, I want the teachers to be part of as we develop that message, because it also needs to come from the individual teachers at the classroom level so that they can be aware of what their students are going to be bringing home and what the expectations are. So as we start fleshing stuff out next year, hopefully there will be some of that. And if I could say one thing about that, thank you for raising that question, because it, that one of the common core failed. Mm -hmm. They didn't communicate with parents. Because NGS has built after common core, they learned lesson. So they have already some communication. Here's information you can give. So there's a starting point for what you take and adapt it to the local school district situation. But NGS has realized that's so important to get parents to really understand 
you know, maybe it'll be a little different. Kids aren't going to be working problems till they're dead. Right? They're going to be maybe looking at how I'm going to about something that happens and how, what, what do you know about how it happens? Right. So I think it is important to communicate. Yeah, and I appreciate that we've been so intentional. So thank you about <laughs> we've been doing this for a while, right? It's easy to say that, but as steals comes up more in articles and literature, mm -hmm. et cetera, and as the PSSA shifts, I think it's really important that we just uh, take some intentional time this year and next year to really make sure that we're communicating um, explicitly with families. Right. Thank you. Thanks for a fantastic presentation. <clears throat> Looks like quite a heavy lift, so uh, congratulations on getting here and good luck getting to the, to the finish line. Quick question in terms of implementation and potential risk mitigation strategies. How do you, how do you kind of define success? How do you know if you're not quite getting there? How, how do you measure whether there's more support needed for staff or whether the students aren't quite capturing? Right, in any program implementation, there's a constant reevaluation to determine. So I'm just curious if you could say a few words about how you sort of think about plan that support from, from end to end in terms of parents, students. I think and there's twofold for that. And one is about we need feedback from the teachers because we need their, not even so much on how the students are faring with it, but how they're doing with implementing the instruction because it is so different. And then also looking at the students and how they're performing. So part of what we're doing right now in particular is we're really focusing on formative assessment in the classroom and really modeling what that's supposed to look like and how we're supposed to be flexible and adapt our instruction based upon what the students are telling us from that formative assessment. So we're collecting data as we do these smaller, quicker formative assessments and then going back and looking at the instruction in teams, in PLTs, at grade levels to say, well, what did you do? What did you do? What's working? What's not working? And then making the changes. And that's actually what this lighthouse model that's that's a main crux of the lighthouse model so that data that we're going to be looking at over the next three years to help guide us as we do this implementation so it's both the teacher input and the students what they're giving back in the assessment do you have anything like that and yeah that? one other thing i, I don't think and yes yeah, why i'm a bit working with marie on this uh, a lot of schools are not familiar with that part of the standards uh they have what are called evidence statements that break it down and these are the different pieces to look at does the student get this? Does the student get this? And so we're starting to acquaint your teachers with that, and that gives them a really good holistic look. Do the kids, are the kids really mastering the standard in a way that other standards don't have that kind of piece-by-piece -piece breakdown? And so I think uh, having them understand how to use those can give them a lot of information about how to see whether their students are making progress. And when I tell you this, and we experienced this in Kentucky, that science and engineering practices, that making arguments, it's a, it's a little bit of a struggle you know, over the hill to get started on that. And so there has to be some patience on the part of the teachers and the school so people learn how, people learn how to do these things. But we have, good, we have good metrics to know whether they're making progress. So a little bit of a facetious question, but um, it seems like the two models are either lighthouse model or drug kicking and screaming to the 21st century. Um, what is in the lighthouse model that we're not doing now? Well, so if you actually, there, if you had the presentation, mm -hmm. I think you have a live version of it, that cute little picture of a lighthouse there is actually mm -hmm. a hyperlink. Uh, and that actually lays out the whole entire yeah, model okay. for you. So what we're proposing is that we're having a hyper focus on PLK. The teachers have actually agreed to do this. Um, and so we have leaders at each grade level that are helping with, we're talking about the formative assessment and then we're guiding questions that are used during PLT for the groups to talk about specifically. And then they have to look at those formative assessments and really reshape what they're doing in the, in the classroom to make adjustments to the student. So, I mean, it's really just back and forth and back and forth until the kids get it right, but making sure that we are correcting any misconceptions, what we're modeling our instruction in such a way where we're guiding it based upon what the student feedback and questions are. Um, and it's just a different, it's just giving extra support to those teachers during this process than just saying, normally when we write new curriculum, it's like, okay, we all write it together and here we go. It, it's really more of a guided approach. And Brett, like I said, Brett's gonna be helping guide us. We're meeting with these teachers outside of PLT to then go work with their PLTs and kind of train the leaders then to bring back their PLTs. I think the, the biggest thing is just being careful about this and not, I don't wanna put extra pressure on teachers. They've experienced years of stress. Um, and so be careful about how much we ask them to do related to this lighthouse model that they're focused on their own development as teachers and their students' performance. 
and then whatever we get out of this will be a benefit because nobody's doing this. this, this. I guess right, my follow-up question is sort of as we assess teachers, what sort of weight are we putting on the ability to be innovative and adaptive and really bend the curriculum versus I used to be really good at what we did? Like, how do we support them both ways? I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. I mean, there's a level of grace that's done with this. We're asking for teachers to tread in areas that they're not comfortable with because this is pain. But, you know, in, in working with them and also doing walkthroughs that are not necessarily evaluative, but just providing feedback from here's what you're doing here and here's what you could be doing if you made these few shifts that would be more aligned to the whole entire three-dimensional process of, of teaching in this way. Um, I think that's a valuable piece for, for teachers. As far as, a, like, evaluative of teachers, we have to give them some flexibility as they're working this out, not to be punitive, but to really be collaborative. That's the goal. We're really trying to create an environment that's, I'm learning this too, right? This is new for me. And when I taught, when I first started teaching, I mean, I do think that I did aspects of it, but I don't think that my focus, and, and not, I'm not trying to, I thought I was a pretty decent teacher. I wasn't horrible, but I don't think that, that my focus was quite as three-dimensional as what I see here. If I had this model in front of me, that would have been something for me to aspire to. But I really think that I would have benefited if I had colleagues that were also trying to do the same thing. So we're really trying to create that network and that community within our department so that we have not just the leadership, but also one another to lean on as we're going through this. So it's really the goal. Can I just, I want to build on Rick's point just really quickly. Um, it's unlikely that there's consensus among the faculty, right? So it sounds like it's going to be great for the students in the short term and long term. It sounds like a more fun curriculum. It sounds like they'll be better off in AP and beyond in college, right? But it sounds like it's quite an adjustment for, for the staff. And they right, uh, can't assume that they're all sort of entirely, completely on board. And so thoughts about the way to sort of manage those expectations and sort of support them. It sounds like there's a great support system in place. But the likelihood is that they're not all as excited about the change as you are. To Rick's point about they were really good at what they were already doing doesn't mean that they're thrilled about the change. Well, I think that part of this is being as transparent as possible. So this is not like, surprise, you know, they've known that this was coming for quite a while. In fact, I mean, the state has kind of been saying, we're getting new standards, we're getting new standards, I, since, I don't know, maybe 2014. And we're trying to stay on top of that. So it, it, to some extent, I think there's a sense of relief in that we know that they're finally here. And now we know what we're working with. So yeah, there are some people that are not 100% on board, but we're hoping that their safety in numbers, that those that are will help though, eventually as you see that it's working. And I can tell you at the middle school, especially, we've had a lot of teachers that have been taking the format of going and using phenomena and then trying the three dimensions and coming back to the department meetings and say, this was really successful. It was a lot, it took more time and I got to get more comfortable with it, but it worked really well and the kids really understood it. And so when that happens, I mean, after a while, you see the writing on the wall and if you want to do a good job at, at your job, you're going to make those shifts. So I have to be honest, though, I don't feel that there's, a, like there's resistance in people with teaching the content specific, but I don't think there's resistance in teaching from this methodology because they do see the value in it. But they do like to teach, they want to hold on to that. But they know that there's going to be some shifts and this is going to happen over a period of time. So hopefully time will help heal all wounds. But at the same time, you know, that collective effort will help us to get even more buy-in. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Excuse me. I, I know we're short on time. Just you brought up the term equitable. And I really like that concept, especially as a special ed teacher. Do you know what I'm going to ask? Um, how does this lend itself for, you know, our students with special needs and our English language learners in particular? Because the whole concept of the phenomena, yes, yeah, so we're looking at the picture, we're verbal, but how does that work for my peeps who are struggling a little bit with communication? So if I can speak to that. Um, so I'm on, um, this year, so I'm on the training team that's helping the state with the teaching part of how do you teach along with this. We have a, a special needs subgroup that's talking about this. Because states have not given enough attention, and it's challenging. And so we're, de we're developing a lot of scaffolding tools for teachers. And since we're in contact, as soon as we develop them, I will bring them in here, and your teachers have the chance to use them. Um, with English language learners, the beauty of this is instead of what is the way science is typically done, put the vocabulary first and intimidate them, because not only is it not their language, but it's technical terms that's not in their language. You don't start there. You start with their ideas. And then when you build the vocabulary on top of it, 
it's much less daunting for them. So we, there's a ton of research to show that this approach helps ELLs tremendously in, the, in terms of the vocabulary. And because, because they're getting the experience, so they have this concrete thing, and then you layer this term, which otherwise would be totally abstract to them, on top of that experience. So the term makes a lot more sense so that they can get into it more easily. Another piece of it, too, is the classroom norms that are set in place. And so all the science classrooms, we've adopted um, classroom norms that come from a resource called Open Syed, which is one of the newer pieces that's come out from a lot of the different trainings um, that have been going on with NGSS. And it's really about making sure that the environment is created where students are sharing ideas. Every idea is valued. And, and those, so that acts as just the conversation itself, which is what guides those questions and those ideas everyone has to contribute to in order for it to be successful. And setting that as your norm really helps to make it more successful. Yep. Yeah, sorry, I guess my follow up to my other questions, now I think about it is, as a board, how can we support well, as clearly a, a good idea? Is it not focusing as much on test scores as we're kind of ramping this up ahead of the curve? Is it like, hey, our scores are here, let's not worry, we're doing this you know, short-term set step back as we redevelop everything, but we think it's a longer term gain? Is it, what are the things as a board that we can do to be supportive of this curriculum? Well, um, understand that there might be some times as far as professional, I'm focusing a lot on professional development because I think if the teachers don't have the skill set, it's not gonna transfer over to the students, right? So there may be some requests coming down the road with some additional trainings for teachers, that would be huge. Um, and also, if you ever have the opportunity that you're in a building to pop into some of these science classrooms and see what's going on, because it is great stuff, to give them that feedback is, would be greatly appreciated. Obviously, budget is always a wonderful thing, but that's, that's going to come with the curriculum cycle. So just be aware that there are going to be a couple of years where we're going to have to kick it up as we're rolling some stuff out, but we hope that that will obviously level itself um, off. And then, you know, I don't really know what to anticipate for these changes that are coming from the state as far as tests are concerned, because they really haven't done a great job, to be honest with you, in communicating it. I'm trying to get ahead of it as best I can and prepare. I don't think that we're going to be different than any other district if there is going to be any kind of dip. But you know, regardless, our community is our, we're already a high performing school district in terms of our science assessments. There might be a dip for a year or two as we adjust, but I'm sure that that will be across the state. I really don't think it would just be a colonial issue. Um, but you know, just your awareness of it as, as community members, and, and we'll get that communication out there, but your awareness of it, if people come and approach you, just understand that we're making a change. And with change, there's always, you know, that delta, there's going to be a flux. So, um, and that's going to take some time, but we're hoping that we're, we're really doing this authentically and we're doing it the right way. And in the long run, we're doing what's best for our kids. I go back to my, it takes a village and you're the leaders of the village. And so if the teachers see you believing in this and believing in them and recognizing them, because they're working hard. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this. Um, I, you know, I've come in and I was a little leery because of the resistance that somebody asked about. Yes, but I saw that. But the way they've embraced this has been so encouraging to me, so exciting for me. And so if they just keep doing that, work, then that's going to make them go that. That's the biggest thing I think we can do. I just have a comment and a question. So the comment is this sounds like something that would make a great um, video focus for Kim Newell to like she talk will. about. Okay, <laughs> like I'm, I'm like excited to see it, like, uh, you know. Um, and the other question, so I don't know how long you said Kentucky's been using this model? 2000, they adopted in 2014. Okay, have they noticed, has, have there been any shifts in, because of the way that this program is structured, in having more, um, say, w women going into more of the science-y kinds of fields and more of the underrepresented groups kind of going because this seems to uh, kind of level the playing field, um, taking it away from all the vocab and the memorization mm -hmm. and, and everything. I don't know data, but I know I could go into a classroom in Kentucky because they track. I could go into a classroom in Kentucky my first year there and tell you what level it was by the demographics class. And that was depressing to me. That started to change by year five there. That there started to be a better representation, especially in the higher track of, of demographics. And I think it was because kids got kids that felt left out of science before got excited and wasn't just about memorizing. They weren't they didn't have to play the game of school. They could 
really do science. So I saw the change in the classrooms. I don't know how that's equated to changes in going into STEM fields, like the data, but I know they're collecting that. Their uh, workforce development cabinet was collecting. I could find that out. Thank you for your time. I would like to thank you, Maria, for your leadership with this in the past for our district. And we're very excited for our partnership with Dr. Chriswell as we continue on this path. And I think it's very exciting that the Colonial School District will serve as a lighthouse model for um, the rest of the state. We're very excited for that as well. And I can assure you that we will be supporting all of our teachers along this shift, as we always do. But And Maria is always right there with them by their side. So we're looking forward to this as well. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to echo that. I want to also thank my colleagues for the great questions. I think that was yes. a really great conversation. Thank you. Um, and just thank you for your passion and your uh, enthusiasm about this, and we look forward to seeing where it goes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you so much. Okay. And the next thing we have on our agenda, and um, you may think that this is probably a little bit late, but that was purposeful, and we would like to give you an update. Um, with our Summer Academy program this year, which is going to have also some shifts to it. So Joe and Ed are going to share them with us. Yes. And, and I apologize. Please introduce yourselves because we do have new board members. I, I'm not good at remembering that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Joe Pacetti. I'm one of the K-12 curriculum supervisors here in the district. Ed Merck, I'm one of the other curriculum supervisors. And with our powers combined, we um, have gone through CSD Summer Academy. Um, so thank you all um, for coming this evening. We just wanted to go over some shifts um, in programming that we had for the summer moving in to the 2024 school year or 25 school year. Um, in the past, we had had two programs that ran consecutively. The first one was a literacy blast that took place immediately after school for invited students only, and that was focused on ELA. We had a second program called Summer Academy, which ran later, typically in August, and that was open to all students. To streamline programming this year, and based on the data that we've collected over the past few years related to attendance, to personnel, as well as student outcomes, we have decided to combine both of those programs into one consolidated academy that is a longer experience for kids, more consistent, and allows us to streamline our services for instruction. So we are offering CSD Summer Academy for incoming grades one through eight. Transportation and meals will be included for students. Grades one through four will be located at Plymouth Elementary, and grades five through eight will be at Colonial Middle School. This is for invited students, and that will be a shift um, from the previous programming for Academy, which was open enrollment. But again, the invite is something that folks will be familiar with based on the ELA programming that we've had in the past. Sign up is going to be before April 5th, 2024, so we can ensure that we have our targets set for transportation as well as food services and have all of those arranged. Program will one run Monday through Thursday, nine to three for students, um, with teacher time built in with some prep before and after, as well as lunch during the day. And there are going to be two coordinators, one for each site, to ensure that we have oversight of both of those programs. We actually did hire our middle school coordinator um, earlier in the day or offered the, uh, the terms to her, which will be fantastic. And we are currently um, still in the process of identifying an elementary coordinator candidate for that. Um, and we don't have that up there, but the program will run from the week after July 4th, so beginning on July 8th through August 1st. Our goal that we're reaching for for students, uh, based off the data that we're going to use to create the invitations, um, is 350 students. Um, with that, we're requiring about 30 teachers, uh, in addition to uh, approximately half of that for instructional aides. So it's going to be a very uh, robust program that we're going to offer in those four weeks. and. You know, that's, that's the goal that we're going to be reaching for, and we're, we're pretty sure we're going to get that to 350 mark. And then in terms of specifics, some of the things um, that we do plan on keeping are the events, activities, speakers that we used to have in the past. So we'll keep it fun and engaging as well as something that's focused on learning. Um, and then as an extension of that, at Plymouth White Marsh High School, um, there are two opportunities for students for summer learning that have been consistent for a few years now. Um, credit recovery, which is for students who are credit deficient. And then finally, online skills builders. Um, every year we allot and elect uh, allot hours for elected teachers to update those skills builders for students so they can access those modules on Canvas during the summer months. Can we invite any questions?
Um, I guess just how um, and when will this get rolled out to our families? When will invitations um, and will some of will our families? What methods will we use to invite them? You know, will there be phone calls home? Will you know to really get the targeted students that we want involved? Yeah, great question. Thanks. So we're going to have um, a couple of different tiers to that for communication. Um, we'll be obviously directly contacting those families via email. Um, we also contact those families via phone as a second kind of pass at that if um, families were not informed. But teachers will be able to also touch base. They will have a list of those students that will be invited for the program, um, as well as administrators. So we have those couple passes. We do have a release that will be put on the website as well, just describing the shift in programming um, and for folks to just pay attention to their email or look for any other notification for that. Um, our target date for that, um, we're actually ahead of schedule, which is very good. Um, we were hoping by the middle of this month to get the invites out to those targeted students. Sure. That was a great question. And just to echo, we're going to make sure everything goes home in students' home languages and families' Absolutely. preferred languages. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> 350 students. Can you remind me the previous attendance? Um, we had the last year because it was two separate programs one half day and one full day alternating days previously is that right so mr carpenter i don't have those numbers offhand i can get them to you though Let's they were more. on average we were 300 uh, a summer Very per comparable. so we figured if we you know to go for a max we had to think of a max for staffing because we have to hire now if we don't hire now we'll be short on staffing if we wait too long so uh that's what we're planning for is 350 and we'll just for that as we get closer. But even if parents drop out, we'll be sure to have our backup list to, OK, great, we have an opening. Would your child like to? Um, 318 was the number last year for Summer Academy, just for reference. And previously, we did not provide transportation, or we did transportation with COVID funds? Last or? year, we provided transportation. Okay. Um, and that was hugely successful to increase our attendance rates. Um, parents, families were enormously thankful for that. So we want to keep continuing that service. We've been using our ESSERS fund to provide transportation. So in the future, we're going to have to talk about that. But it has been successful. Yep. We still have it for this summer. Yes, this that's summer. what I said. In the future. <laughs> Any other questions on that? All right, so we'll be getting out some general communication because we do know that at the building level, as well as at the district level, we have gotten some inquiries. Um, because as you know, summer camps are filling up. Um, so we will get communication out about that as soon as possible. All right. Uh, and then the next thing is also Joe. He's going to share with us two issue briefs. These are not new to you. We have discussed these as a board. Um, but again, we do have some new board members, and we do have some new nuances to these issue briefs. So the two issue briefs I'll be presenting this evening are for AP African American Studies, which is in its second phase of a pilot. Um, and AP Mo World History, which would be the modern component of history there. Um, the first one, AP African American Studies, we have to go through a formal process each year when the College Board is releasing pilots. So while we've had the course for a full year now, um, one of the few high schools in the region that actually does offer that course, we're very proud to say, um, with high enrollment, we wanted to make sure that we were presenting to the Board Phase 2. The only differences you'll find in that issue brief um, is that there are some small changes to the curricular focus and scope and sequence of the course. Um, so attached there, um, the board at your leisure can review those potential changes. There's also an at a glance from last year as well as last year's issue brief that went through initially for the first phase of the pilot. So really consider it just small changes to the course to make sure that it's more meaningful for students based off of teacher feedback um, that they had received from the college board. Um, so that is the first one. The second one, AP World History, Modern, will take place um, in terms of years from 1200 CE to the current day. Uh, the rationale behind this was to offer ninth graders who will be taking world history shortly um, as their introductory course at the high school, uh, previously they had been taking it currently really, um, eighth and ninth grade is U.S. history. We wanted to make sure that it, the U.S. history course was placed in its appropriate placement in a sequence in 11th grade. So there was some resequencing that we discussed last year with the board um, that we got approval for. But for AP World History Modern, this is going to be available primarily for ninth grade students, but is also available for other students that would want an AP credit focused on this, um, this period of time in history. Uh, the team has been hard at work scoping and sequencing out all of the uh, intricacies of that course and continue curriculum writing now. Um, and we've generated a lot of interest based on the February forums that we had for AP over at PW. 
Any questions? Any questions about the issue briefs? One theoretical question. For the AP courses in ninth grade, is there any concern that the rising ninth graders might not have the same success level that they're rushing to take an AP course before their writing skills are good enough for those sort of courses and any way that we're communicating to them that it's not a you don't have to take every single EP course like, and trying to pick and choose? Yeah. Good question, Mr. Carpenter. So one of the things that we've been working with in vertical articulation with teams is the ninth grade team had visited the eighth grade team at a recent PLT to discuss skills, dispositions, assessments, and all the other components necessary for success in ninth grade generally, and more specifically to courses that may be rigorous, like an AP World History course. Um, the other rationale that we had behind the resequencing is that progressively we've seen a lot of students decline in scores nationally um, and in our AP, um, uh, the AP prospectus report, and I can, forgive me, I can't actually remember the exact name of the report that we get, but students who would show demonstrated success in an AP course based on their current grades um, in AP US, which currently is offered in ninth grade. Most, uh, most schools have shifted that to 11th grade for a reason because of the level of writing analysis and document-based question strategies required of it. AP World is the one for ninth grade that is a much easier kind of entrance, so to speak, to that world of rigor that they would have to scaffold up those writing skills for. Um, so our hope is that we'll see demonstrated success in this course. So in future AP courses, they'll be equivalently successful. Okay, thank you very much. And the final thing on our agenda is a conference request. This is a conference request for Mr. Drew Bogley. Um, and he is headed to Miami in April. And it is for the Consortium of School Networking. Um, the conference has great workshops, breakout sessions with topics on cybersecurity, data, data privacy, AI readiness, as well as disaster preparedness. Um, so that conference request is attached to the agenda as well as in board docs, and we will ask you for your support on Thursday. And Mrs. Burke is giving me the angry eyeball. Any final <laughs> questions any, or thoughts? Yeah, any questions? Any comments? Any public comments? No. No? All righty. That concludes our curriculum meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mrs. Thank Mr. you Mr. all. Uh, welcome to the um, CRSL meeting for Monday, February 12th. Um, is there any public comment on the agenda? No? Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Burke. Good evening, everybody. Um, I, we have three items on our agenda this evening. The first, I'm very, very excited. Um, we have guests with us who are going to discuss um, our resolve room at the middle school. This is a new initiative um, for this year, and we are thrilled to death. And I'm going to, in a second, introduce the principal from the middle school, Sean Kaplan, who will discuss it in detail. Um, after that, um, Melissa Figueroa Douglas is going to give us some updates um, in our EIB programming and committee. And then last but not least, Jess Lester is going to give us um, some of our website application updates as well. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Kaplan, who is going to introduce our guests and um, celebrate with us. Take two. No, no need for the teacher voice. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Sean Kaplan, principal at the middle school. Uh, really excited to present about a, a really special program that we were able to kick off this year and, and that we found a ton of success with. And want to highlight that for you all and talk about what it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis with us and uh, where we see it moving in the, in the future. Before I go any further, I want to step aside to allow a very special partner of ours to introduce herself. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm Nafisa. I am from Lakeside, and I work as the Resolve Room Conflict Resolution Specialist. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you, Nafisa. We also have Ms. Janine Whaley with us here tonight, who is another partner of ours from Lakeside. Uh, Ms. Whaley's been a big part of this program as well. So before we jump into the details, I just want to present really the most zoomed out version of this. The, 
the resolve room, we'll get into the what, the how, the why, the where. Um, but going back really even further past uh, last summer, the resolve room idea came about with conversations at the building level with Mrs. Burke, with Mr. Murch about how we can respond to challenges that we've identified with students. And something that we talk about often is that when conflicts arise and conflicts take many different shapes and forms, not every student has the same tools in their toolbox that everyone else has. And sometimes their tools might need to be sharpened a little bit or they might need to be refocused a little bit. And we, we wanted to find a way to help students with that effort. Um, there was a lot of good things that we had in place already, but we felt that there was a missing piece, which was helping students process the conflicts that they have in the moment, try and get ahead of them before that moment occurs, and also try and you know, return from, from those moments more ready to have a good rest of the day and to avoid them in the future. So we called our friends at Lakeside and learned from their experience with resolve rooms that they're running at other districts, some having similar challenges, some having different challenges. And we talked about what those models look like and how it might fit our needs. Uh, she introduced us to Ms. Green, and it, it uh, really began at the start of the school year. It's, it's evolved, it's developed, but most importantly, it's made a profound, profound positive impact on our students as individuals and on the climate of our building as a whole. So that's, that's kind of the origin of the idea, and we'll get into a little bit more of what it looks like day to day. So what is the Resolve Room? It, it's hard to, to define concisely because it serves so many purposes for so many students, but to try and be as concise as possible. It's a safe space for all students to regulate their emotions. Regroup, I think, is probably the key word. Something happens, maybe it's a small problem that feels like a big one, maybe it's a big problem on the verge of becoming a huge one, and it's a space that they can go to safely, calmly, to process what they're going through with a, with a professional who's able to connect them and see them as a person, and again, equip them with the tools that maybe they don't have, or maybe they're just not ready to use in that, in that particular instance. Uh, where is the Resolve Room? It's in a, a classroom that we have right now that it is solely dedicated to these purposes. Students know where it is, the location doesn't change, and that consistency helps uh, settle some of the, the uh, flight or flight feelings that they're feeling when they're, when they're escalated. Students uh, go there as a positive outlet too, as Ms. Green will share. There's been quite a few lunches had in there to celebrate successes and uh, overcoming challenges. Um, and it's also used as an alternative or addition to discipline when needed too, to really close the loop, not just, you know, here's what you did, here's what you get, but here's what you did and here's how you can fix it. And, and we've, we're starting to find a lot of success with that and we feel really good about it. So among many roles, what does Ms. Green do? And you'll, you'll get a sense for why this is hard to justify in, in one slide when she starts to speak about her work with students. But things that I alluded to earlier, teaching students to navigate conflict independently. Um, one of the things that we're most proud of is that the students that Ms. Green spent the vast majority of her time with earlier in the year are really only seeing her for positive reasons now, uh, which shows that they're equipped with those skills and they're really applying them and, and hearing them uh, speak to that themselves is, is something really special to see. And again, that, that's what contributes to the improved climate. Uh, provide smooth transitions back into school following instances. If something occurs where a student uh, is, is briefly removed from the school setting or, or needs to step away from a class for, for even a short period of time, Ms. Green's right there to ease that transition back. Oft, oftentimes, and something that we're working uh, on even more now is working with the teachers to help, to help do that, even in the classroom, not just in her resolve room upstairs. Um, and that kind of speaks to the last bullet point there, too. Uh, a little over halfway through the year now, finding a lot of success um, with a large number of students, it, we're, what we're beginning to work on now is helping teachers model those same behaviors and those same approaches um, you know, to handle it kind of in-house, too, uh, meaning their classroom. So there's many hats that Ms. Green wears, and I'll hand it off to her to speak a little bit more about her approach and, again, what it looks like each day. So... Speaking on the mic is weird. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say, uh, before we get started, um, a lot of the work that is done in the Resolve Room. So the Resolve Room is a very unique space. It's set up where we have a calm corner for kids to kind of, our students to kind of regulate their emotions. We play a lot of music in the Resolve Room. There are fidgets there for kids who kind of just need like that quick check-in um, and are a little bit unsettled and just need something in order to go back into class. 
So it is a very unique space, but it is work that I do in a resolve room, but also I've been invited to, had the opportunity to be invited to some reinstatement meetings to talk about how we can move forward with the kids after um, needing to leave school for a suspension. Um, also doing some classroom observations to see what are the triggers, what are the things that are getting students kind of dysregulated in the moment and see how we can address those things with the students or whatever peers are bringing them to their point in the classroom. Um, and then also collaborating with counselors, some of the guidance counselors at CMS. So it's nice to be able to uh, collaborate with them too to best support the needs. So yes, the resolve room is where the work gets done, but I'm generally all over the building as needed when needed. Um, let's see. I had this all mapped out really nicely. <laughs> um, so now, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, so students kind of find their way, find themselves to me mostly because they're in some sort of conflict. Something has happened, some, something has happened with a peer, and then they find themselves to me. So what we usually do is um, a peer-to-peer -peer session. Sometimes we meet individually to so just help the student navigate what has went wrong. Let's go through the text messages. Let's see where, you know, the, where kind of the conversation went left with your friend or with someone who's not a, an identified friend, and let's see how we can work to kind of repair that situation. So I do some individual sessions. Sometimes we can meet in groups. Um, sometimes we can meet with the person they're in conflict with. And they're, re they're referred to me via admin. Um, students come to me by themselves all the time, really. Um, and we meet during, we do meet, have some meetings during our lunch sessions to kind of process what's happening throughout the day. We also will meet in the afternoons during homeroom to process what has happened during the day, like some highs, some lows, or just kind of decompress after, you know, a long day in school. Um, like Mr. Kaplan said, I do also provide some additional support with some disciplinary things. While you are in a resolve room for like an in-school suspension, we won't just be sitting there kind of like twiddling our thumbs. I like to break down what happened. What caused this suspension? Is there relationships that need to be repaired? Can we, you know, I think me and you, we've written out like an apology letter or do we need to go and talk to another student? Was there a fight that happened? Um, and just kind of work on why are we here for the in-school suspension and how can we repair it? And then what steps should we take before re-entering um, that setting? Do we need to... Um, talk about scheduling changes. Should you find somewhere to sit? Just like those nuanced things that happen just in middle school. Like, should we find somewhere else to sit in a lunchroom? Are there friends that you haven't connected with that maybe we can reconnect with? Um, just to kind of get you back into a good space before coming off the in-school suspension. Um, so then here are some of the numbers. Um, so it was very interesting to kind of go through the numbers. We kind of talked about it a bit, just how many kids are coming to the resolve room. So like I say, kids are either referred to the resolve room via admin, the um, assistant principals or counselors, and then kids just find themselves to room 341 and, and come say, like, Ms. Green, this is happening. Me and this girl are having this problem. Um, so, so far, um, it's about 100. This was as of January, um, but about 115 students. Um, 110 plus referrals from admin, and then I've had countless interactions, one-to-ones, check-ins, lunches, homeroom sessions with about 300 students um, throughout my time here thus far. And then this is the data point. So these are the things we do. Like I said, it's the conflict resolution sessions where peers are kind of at some conflict and want to sit down and resolve it. So there's been about 103 of them. Peer mediations are generally when students are at a place where this isn't really a problem, but I want to I want some tools and I want some interventions so that I know how to address this moving forward or repairing a relationship. So the peer mediations where a lot of apologies happen, a lot of I didn't mean for this to happen. So we've done about 15 of those. Um, a lot of emotional dysregulation support. These are sometimes our students who find themselves as to leave the classroom for one reason or another. Um, they come to me, we kind of decompress, we kind of do some deep breathing, take a fidget, get ourselves together and get back to class. Um, I have had one successful small group, which I'm very proud of and hope to do a lot more of those. 
I've also recently been doing more push and support where there's been an identified need to kind of observe what's happening in the classroom with a student and a specific peer or a student and the teacher. So I've been in classrooms more doing that work. And then my favorite part of the day are the daily lunches where we just meet, play Uno, just talk and just what's happening with you outside of school and conflict. Um, so those are the numbers. Thank you, Ms. Green. So just looking ahead, there's, there's obviously a, Ms. Green's very busy during the day, as you can imagine, and not to, to stretch her any further out than she already is, but these are some ways that we think we can continue to build efficiency and, and be proactive on things to avoid the, the small issues becoming larger ones, large ones becoming excessively large ones like we referred to earlier, and here's what we have our eyes on for that. Um, Ms. Green's doing it informally now, some check-in and check-out, using data to identify students that would really benefit from meeting with whether it's Ms. Green or another counselor to make sure their day's off to a really good start. And then same thing at the end of the day. Uh, training with, with staff to use these approaches in the classrooms. You can see on the previous slide, that's starting. The number's low there because we're starting to begin that rollout. And it's really important for buy-in from the staff members too, as you know, they hear that their colleagues are having success with the support of Ms. Green being physically present in their classroom. The, the interest and desire in uh, spreading that um, becomes a lot more uh, easy to implement. And then again, expanding upon proactive classroom visits, not just, hey, Ms. Green, these two students had a little bit of a shouting match, but hey, I just want you in here just to see the climate and, and take a look and make sure the students know that you're not just waiting for them in 341 when they might be having some trouble, but that you're a big part of the school day. The vast majority of our students know that already. And again, making sure that the doors are open for Nafisa to model um, the way that conflict should be handled and that interactions should, should take place is, uh, those are all things that we have our eyes on in the future. So um, just one last piece on, on the data. Uh, we have a very, very detailed spreadsheet, certainly more than the bullet points that we highlighted here for Who's, who's referred to speak with Ms. Green at what time? Is it because of the student? Is it because of the admin, counselors, teacher? How many times is that individual student there? What took place while they were there? How long were they actually there? And having that detail really helps us be intentional with what we're planning out as the next steps. Um, again, there's always gonna be time to react, but getting ahead of it as much as possible um, is certainly what, what we believe is most productive. So, um, so that's, that's the resolve room in a, in a nutshell, certainly be happy to answer any questions that you might have about what the program looks like at CMS. Is this uh, one of the programs that was funded by a grant? Or is, I know we've had Lakeside. Uh, so this is theoretically something that we have another year of, and then we've got to figure out what we want to do? So we, th this is funded by a grant, and we have um, funding to, uh, for the Resolve Room right now for two years. Um, but there are continued grants that come across my desk that I will continue to fill out and to apply for. But we wanted to pilot the program, see if it was effective. Um, clearly, it has been, it's, it's, it's in its infancy, and it's already exploding. And, um, very, very effective, and the hope is that we could expand this to the high school at some point as well. Um, one of the things, I mean, I, I, I have always been impressed with the philosophy that um, Lakeside uses. I've been working with Lakeside Network for 40 years, maybe a little bit more, um, and one of the things that has always impressed me is that they look at behaviors as, as a learning process for our kids and understanding that our kids come to us, some have lots of behavioral tools in their toolboxes and some don't. And in schools, we typically have done the punitive model. You know, you don't follow the rules and there's a consequence. And the consequence isn't always a very positive one. There's suspension, detention. But what we don't do is give kids replacement behaviors. And we don't give the t kids the tools, typically, that they need. So the next time they are faced with a similar situation, they can pull from their toolbox something that would be much, much more positive for them, a much more positive experience. That is what this program does. And 
I think the fact that we've had, what, 300 kids approximately who are seeking it out means that they themselves are recognizing that they need the tools and they themselves then become empowered to take control of their behaviors instead of their behaviors taking control of them. So it's something that we want to continue. Um, we want to uh, spread the, the wealth and give our teachers the tools that they need too so that they can deal better with the kids and with the behaviors that are presented in the classroom. Thank you. This is amazing um, results. And I was wondering if you have noticed a, a decrease in the number of in school detentions and things like that, like percentage wise or any? We, mo we most certainly have. It's, again, I, I know I'm referring to just being as proactive as possible as we can. And it takes time and it's a lot of hard work. And Miss Green's running constantly most days. But it's worth it because we have seen that decrease, especially in the larger incidents, the one that the ones that are most disruptive, those have have de they've decreased. They've they've decreased noticeably. And that's because of all the hard work that Miss Green does to respond and, and especially on the relationship piece too. There's there's a trust there. We talk a lot about uh, effective programs, but they need to be run with highly effective people and, and Miss Green does an unbelievable job on that side. It sounds like a, a resounding success, so congratulations. This is thank you. Um, I think a lot of workplaces can benefit by one having <laughs> one of these rooms. Um, a, a, a couple of thoughts. I'm just curious if, it, although it says there's a lot of self referrals, mm -hmm. uh, this is a program that sounds like it should be celebrated, and I'm sure you're doing that to some extent and socialized in the way that that these tools provided students that they hadn't previously had or maybe even thought of particularly even parents, right? Um, but is there a stigma associated with going to the room given that there is some balance, it seems, of potentially right uh, uh, disciplinary sort of action? So that's question one, again, to figure out if there is some sort of stigma, how to push into the classrooms to sort of mitigate the impact of any any potential stigma. And then I'm just curious how the confident, if there's sort of, and maybe that's the wrong and better way to put it, but confidentiality, for lack of a better way to put it, in terms of students that may feel comfortable sharing, but then may find themselves in a worse disciplinary position because they've they've talked to you about something. Great. To, those are really good questions. I'll talk about the first one first from my perspective and then hand it off to Ms. Green. Um, I, I don't think that there's a stigma because the students that are referred to Miss Green or refer themselves or, or both, they really enjoy the time spent with her. I think there's, it's not, coming to my office might be a little bit different. Going to Miss Green's is something that they're really excited about. Um, even if it's for a less than pleasant reason, sometimes it will have a student that'll maybe stamp their, you know, stomp their feet on their way there a little bit, but they know they're gonna get the help they need and come back better for it, so. Um, that that's the first part. Nafisa, maybe speak to. I was literally I was going to say literally the exact same thing um, because this is all brand new to me and the students. I'm definitely big on, you know, this is just a conversation. We're just going to talk this out. And again, there's music playing, so the atmosphere doesn't feel as um, tense. And it, we're just talking back and forth. I will say there may be a bit of a stigma as I am now going into more classrooms. So students who know me from dealing with conflict or having an in-school suspension or now seeing me pop in somewhere classroom. So there is a little bit of a stigma there, like, is she here from me or, you know, what's happening? But as far as coming to the resolve room, it's been pretty pleasant, even if they were, you know, brought there by security or brought there, you know, by some other member of admin. Yeah, I mean, this seems like a no-brainer uh, in terms of sustaining this and, and bringing it to the high school. Uh, and next time you visit, we can talk about what, what kind of music you're playing in there. Yeah, I'm interested in that piece. Thank you. Um, this goes, I know it's in the trash, sorry. Uh, a little similar question to what we were talking about earlier in terms of supporting staff. So I really appreciate, um, especially in terms of sustainability, as, as amazing as Karen is with grant writing and, and so on, um, it's really important to be uh, that this is sustained. So we're not going to just do this once or twice and then, you know, it moves on. So I appreciate that there is a plan to bridge this into the classrooms, help teachers to identify, work with their triggers, you know, how they're showing up and all of those things. My wondering goes back to the question earlier around resistors, and I'm using that term very broadly. 
Um, but I know as a former principal that there are, um, when change occurs, sometimes that mindset shift from punitive to more restorative and um, preventative can be challenging. So my wondering, wondering is, are we, are we finding that? Are we not finding that? Um, are there staff members that are saying, no, there should be a consequence for this? They, don't, they shouldn't be in the resolve room. They should be wherever. Where are we with that, just in terms of the implementation? It's, good. it's a really good question, something that I worried about as we were rolling this out, too. And I think we had some really good strategic pieces in place to try and avoid that as much as possible. Um, some items on the referral form for teachers, for instance, that if you're going to ask a student to leave your room to go to the resolve room, here's a few things that we need you to do. And for some pe people that may be resistors, that might make them think twice if a student really needs to leave or not, which even if they're not fully bought into it immediately, we're kind of getting the same end result that we'd like as far as managing that relationship and helping them manage the conflict on their own. Teachers have their hands full with instruction and personalities and social emotional needs in the classroom, but you know, there's, there's things that sometimes we really need enough, enough use of help for, as the, the data says, but there's also plenty of things that they can take care of on their own, and something like that, the referral form has, has kind of cut into that for the resistors. On, the, on the, the more positive side, especially over halfway through the school year now and people are seeing the success that we're having, it's, it kind of speaks for itself. So people are less reluctant to buy in because they, they know that it, it's working for their colleague. They know that Ms. Green just popped into the social studies class on their team and that it went really well and they hear about it. So there's been a really nice kind of grassroots approach to spreading the, the philosophy and it's really starting to catch on. Thank you. This sounds amazing, and I appreciate the hard work that's gone into it. Thank you. Um, I just had a question. How is this being, um, I guess, explained? Or, or, or um, I, I'm trying to think of it from a, a student's perspective. If you know, if I'm coming to your room and I'm, you know, get gaining coping skills and learning restorative uh, justice practices, but then I go home and my home is very punitive. How do I navigate the two? Is there any sort of outreach with parents to say, you know, little Johnny learned this today, and and this is the, you know the philosophy that we're using, et cetera, so that it's a little more streamlined. I, 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 granted, we don't want to tell parents what to do or how to. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. So it's absolutely. not so such conflicting information for a little person. Yeah. I think with a lot of the referrals, especially from admin, there's always a conversation um, like, hey. This is what happened at school, and a part of that conversation with the parents has been, you know, they're going to meet with Ms. Green, and this is the things Ms. Green does in the room. Um, so I don't know how much the students are going home and saying that. But I know with those referrals, um, admin is usually having a conversation with parents to say, these are the topics kind of discuss this is the way. They'll process it. And sometimes parents have said, you know, they didn't want the tech and done, or, you know, but that's how it's been working so far. Yeah. Have you had any feedback from parents of the students that have visited your room, like positive or, you know? The feedback that we've had has been very positive. Um, it's really nice to offer if a parent reaches out and says, my son's having an issue with the student in math class, and, you know, we investigate, we get involved, we help, and then when, when it seems fitting, which is most case, cases we share with the parents, hey, we'd like to get so-and-so together with Ms. Green and the other student, are you okay with this, are you okay with this? Ms. Green typically meets with them separately first and then brings them together, and um, they're really appreciative. And again, it's, it's just so effective at actually squashing it and not letting, a, letting an issue linger and continue. So the feedback has been great, and you know, we're talking a lot about tools and student toolboxes. It's, it's really a tool in our toolbox, too, to, to help get ahead of things and, and close them out. No, last year there was a lot of issues that um, kids getting suspended for things that happened outside of school and then boiled down into school. I know we've done a lot of more programming this year as far as social media. How many, as we're giving kids tools in the toolbox, what percentage do you say are just instant frustration versus long boiling, like teaching them how to be people? That's a question from Mr. That is. <laughs> that is. I think there are still some impulsive things happening, but I think with the work that we've been doing, um, a lot of kids know to say, like, this is what happened Saturday. I get a lot of Monday morning 
oh, we were all at the mall and this happened. Um, so we're processing it kind of as soon as it happens because, it, you know, by the time they get to me Monday, it has kind of already lingered. It's been 48 hours of group chats and 48 hours of social media. So we will meet first thing Monday morning, um, sometimes individually, and then bring the group together. Um, but I, I think that it has really helped to kind of mitigate some of the outside school things because even if it is happening Saturday afternoon, if they could just hold on, you know, because they don't see each other much outside of school, it's a lot of it is on the phone. They can just hold on till Monday or Tuesday. We'll process it in school. Um, but some of the things are still just happening impulsively. Ms. Green has done a wonderful job. Part of what she's doing is not just about how to resolve conflict, helping them understand the impact of stress and trauma on the brain. So, to your question, sir, one of the reasons why students are being able to exercise that muscle and really put some distance between them and then Monday because they can just. You're welcome. And so one of the things that she has done is help them understand what is really happening when their stress response is activated, how to take that pause. And so part of the work that we do is really that brain-based conflict resolution. We educate students and staff about what, what is really happening when you experience a stress or when you experience a conflict. And so that's how they're able to put that, to, you know, to have that regulation and put that distance between whatever the incident is and their response. And she's done phenomenal. I spoke to some children today in one of her lunch bunch groups, and I said, can you talk to me a bit about how this is working? And it was really organic. It wasn't, you know, orchestrated, I promise you. And three of the young women said to me, she helps me not get suspended anymore. She can answer the hard questions for me. And she's always there when I need her. And so they really, um, from my understanding, and Mr. Kaplan and Ms. Green can speak to this directly, were some high flyers prior to encountering our program. So it just speaks to some of the work. Um, and I, I believe some of the staff can also speak to it, but it just speaks to the intervention and the impact it's having on the students. Thank you. Do you think there'll be any um, transition um, type uh, growing pains for eighth graders that are going to see Miss Green and when they get to the high school, Miss Green's not there and we don't have the room set up, uh, that, that program set up at the high school for next year. So do we? That, that is something that we're in discussion with now. Um, I know that Dr. Bakani is coming down to the middle school to observe and to speak with Ms. Green um, and with Mr. Kaplan and talk about um, what it would look like at the high school um, and how we could move that forward. So yeah, I mean, it's something that I'm hoping to do at some point. I forget, I know we discussed this previously, the quiet space or the at the high school for stepping back. Did that get implemented or? I, I, uh, there are some quiet spaces, yes. But this would be a little bit different right. than a quiet this space. Like a, this is yeah. kind of like a quiet learning space. <laughs> but yeah. Well, if there's anything that we can do as a board to assist Oops, sorry, in that figuring out, you know, let us know. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I, I just want to thank you profoundly. Um, the difference that you have made is astounding, and it's something that should be celebrated. Um, I can honestly say that Ms. Green is, is truly a staff member of the middle school. Um, from the day that she came, she hit the ground running, was out there in the hallways, in the cafeteria, um, in, in the classrooms, recognizing kids by name, um, truly is a part of the staff. And we're thrilled to have her. And we're thrilled to have the support 
of uh, Ms. Whaley um, from Lakeside, and um, we're looking forward to growing the program. So thank you very, very thank much. You. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for your support. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda um, is Ms. F uh, Figueroa Douglas to talk about the EIB updates. So, were you able to get that? Okay. Let me see if it works. They say the third time's a charm. <laughs> Good morning, members of the board, community members, and staff here for the Colonial School District. My name is Melissa Figueroa Douglas, and I'm the Equity and Advancement Officer here for the Colonial School District. And it is my pleasure to provide for you updates from the last, since the last CRSL meeting around our district-wide equity, inclusion, and belonging initiative. I am really um, excited to share that we are taking part in celebrating not only two graduates of PW, two distinguished graduates of PW, but we are also celebrating this community and the rich history that is aligned to the Colonial School District community. And right now we are district-wide exploring a village remembered, which is authored by two PW grads from 1971, I believe. Um, Jessica Lester just did an interview with both authors. We have our uh, EIB student leadership team that was engaged with even providing some of the questions for that interview. We are really excited to go on a tour of Abolition Hall on February 23rd. And um, again, just really understanding the impact of the abolitionists that were here in this community and how they supported the freedom of enslaved people. So that is something that we are really excited about. And when we think about CRSE, which stands for Culturally Relevant and Sustaining Education, what is more relevant than the history of your school district community? Making that come alive for our students. Um, and when we look at CRSE, we are really excited to um, really engage with what the state PDE has around expectations for implementation. Um, what's interesting is that it is an expectation for implementation, but it also is um, interesting that some districts in Western Pennsylvania are choosing not to uh, support uh, this framework. But we have, and we do so by sharing monthly recordings district-wide with staff. We do so by sharing colonial cultural connections. This month in particular, we are celebrating and highlighting the Lunar New Year along with Black History Month. Um, we provide professional development. Uh, CRSE was a part of our best practices fair. It is also a part of our upcoming PD Day. So along with unpacking the CRSE framework every single month, at each building and sharing these recordings. This is something that we are embedding through professional development as well. And this week we have our students at CMS and PW engaging with uh, the University of Pennsylvania with our EIB student leadership team. So we meet every month as a leadership team but this is a really exciting time of the school year as our students from the middle school and the high school have an opportunity to co-mingle, collaborate with hundreds of students from the tri-state area. So it, this goes beyond um, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Our students have the opportunity to also engage with like-minded students from Delaware, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. So that is this Thursday and this Friday, and we are really excited about it. Something else our EIB student leadership team is doing this month 
is engaging with our EIB building leadership team. So we offer trainings um, from nationally renowned uh, people. I offer trainings and facilitate trainings as well. Uh, something that's interesting this month is the University of Pennsylvania will be here and we are going to further explore the PSSM, Psychological Sense of School Membership. Uh, we are going to further explore that data we're doing so with students, with teachers, and with administrators. So we're really excited about that later this month. That's going to be February 28th. And we have our last EIB committee meeting coming up in March, March 18th, 2024. Our last meeting um, was back in, back in October where we explored the first cycle of PSSM. We are going to provide an overview of the EIB initiative since that point to where we are on March 18th. And uh, similar to last school year, we will have an opportunity for schools to put a spotlight on the schools and what they're doing around the EIB initiative. So 30, approximately 30 minutes will be used for updates and then we're going to do a gallery walk to the various schools district-wide to see um, all the great work that's happening around equity, inclusion, and belonging. And last, but certainly not least, if you didn't notice, equity, and inclusion, and belonging does not fall on the shoulders of one person in this district. This is something that the students take ownership in, our staff takes ownership in, and our community members take ownership in. And we are interdependent of one another to make sure that the EIB initiative is sustained here at the Colonial School District. Any questions? Okay, because I don't have the same wait time. I've been out of the classroom for that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Melissa does an outstanding job, I do have to say. Um, and last but not least, we have Jess Lester, who's going to enlighten us about our web app. So, um, hi everybody, Jessica Lester, uh, Community Relations Coordinator for the School District, and I've been um, before this committee a couple times to talk about our long-awaited app, <laughs> which has been quite an undertaking um, just due to some of the changes with the vendor that we're working with. And I'm excited to say that we are finally on the, we're on the road to having something that I hope we can share with the community pretty soon. So I just wanted to show you um, what it looks like so far. And we still have some tweaking to do. But basically, this is the um, screen that you will see when you would open the app. And um, the feed at the top is similar to what you would see in the um, news and announcements section on our homepage. And uh, because this isn't the live app, um, you can't really scroll through, but maybe I'll play and, and see if you can see. Like, you can use your finger to swipe to the right, see all of those news items as they come up. Um, and then you can click into the news item to read the story um, and get more information. And then um, the one thing that I think is really neat about this is it's pretty easy to even go ahead and share these. So if you tap the, I don't know if you caught that, um, there's a little share button up here in the top. And when you click on that, um, you probably saw my contacts come up, <laughs> my husband and my kid. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you wanted to text that, that article link to somebody, you could easily do that from the app and not have to even, you know, go to the website or anything like that. Um, let's see, as we move on, um, the calendar feed is beneath um, all of the news items. Um, you can click into certain calendar items to get more information. This is about, obviously, tonight's meetings. Um, and then all along the bottom, there are these icons that when you click into them, um, it will take you into, um, these are like all of our news feeds from all of our um, school pages and the district pages. But if you see this filter button up here, you can filter them so that, say, you're a Ridge Park parent, you don't want to see you know, all the other schools, you can go in and click off just Ridge Park and only get their news. And I don't remember if I actually did that in this little demo or not. Yeah, I did. I, so I clicked off a couple different things, um, but that would be where you could make your selections about what you wanted to 
um, you know, get for your newsfeed. And then it will update and, you know, give you all of the, the things that you asked for. Um, and then if it moves on, uh, this is the directory. So this is, you know, everybody's name comes up here. I think I searched for myself <laughs> just to show um, that, again, you can click on the person's name and click on their email address and compose an email right there without having to go, you know, um, in and out of different applications. Um, and then this was just to show you the menus, you know, it goes right to the menus. Um, so we put all of those items down in this little bar. And then if you click on the more button here, it takes you to, you know, sort of deeper um, uh, parts of our website. Um, and we're, Kim and I, are, Kim Newell and I are still kind of fine tuning what we put in those sections. So again, if you guys have any suggestions, um, I'm, recognizing, I'm recognizing now we probably need a, a school board link in there so that people can get meeting agendas and things like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, if you you know if there are things that you see you don't see there that you think parents are you know going to want or our community members are going to want, you know we're certainly open to adding them. The only problem is the more you add, you know, kind of goes off the screen. So um, not that that's really a problem in my mind. You know, you can you know we can we can you know fine tune it as we go along. Um, the section up here again, this my schools will allow people to. Um, filter if they want to, and then the notifications is the other big um, thing for me in terms of communication um, and thinking about, um, sorry, this is just showing more filtering, um, but thinking about, you know, weather events, <laughs> which we may have one tomorrow. Um, with the push notifications, um, and I'm just going to see if I, it'll continue through. Oh, I think I was showing that you can filter the calendars as well there. Um, and then you can go into each of the school buildings and get their information. That was under the, um, the uh, our schools section. Um, this is just again showing you that you you know can click to the forms if you need to. Um, and we're going to kind of work on that that page a little bit so that it's a little bit easier just to get to your school's form. Um, again, link to PowerSchool um, to sign in right there. And I think I was showing, OK, so this is the notifications. We were doing some testing today. Um, but basically, when, when we have a weather event, we'll be able to use the system to send out a push notification that will just pop up on your phone. And I think the most exciting part of it is, say, say we have um, you know, people who live in our school district that um, maybe send their children to private schools, but they still need to know whether or not we're open or closed or we're busing students, they'll be able to sign up for this app. They'll download the app, and then they'll get a notification right on their phone. Um, and I think that will help, you know, again, with um, some of the questions we get every snow day. Can I be added to the list? Yes, you can. You can, you can download our app and, you know, get your notifications. Even students can use this. You know, maybe a student wants to get notified in the morning. Um, on his or her personal device, and they can, again, download the app and they'll get a push notification um, telling them whether or not, you know, we have a delay or a good day or whatever it may be. So um, I'm pretty excited to, um, you know, be able to use that. And, uh, and I think the schools, um, again, uh, Ms. Newell and I will probably go and train um, principals, building secretaries on how to use this push notification system. So if they have something they need to remind people about, one more way we can reach people directly without them having to go into their email, you know, or any, um, go to the website, it's right there for them. So in a nutshell, I know you've listened for a long time, so I, I won't take up any more of your time, but if you have any questions that I can answer? This looks great, thank you. I'm excited about it. I, you know, it's, it was a long time coming, and, and if you do, just again, um, so you know some of the background, we did have a different version of this that was not working properly. So if anybody goes to the App Store, we, we still have that old app in the App Store, but this will replace it. So <laughs> just on the off chance anybody tries to go download it, um, that one that's in there is old and will be replaced by this new one. So, um, and we're hoping that will occur in like the next week or so. so. But I haven't, we haven't publicized it anywhere, but we do plan, you know, big push um, when it's all ready to go to teach parents how to download it, you know, how they can filter and set everything up so that it's just the way they want it. So, right. Yeah. The district can send out like uh, flash alerts around weather related things and, and whatnot. 
Can principals send out just specifically for their school if there's an update around something that they need to? Yeah, out? they they could, um, and they can tailor. They can so like so if any if somebody was at Conshohocken and they were signed up for Conshohocken um, email their email list, and the principal used just that list to send out only those people that were subscribed to that list would get. So you the have to subscribe to it first. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. Thank that you. that is that is one catch to this. Everybody will have to opt into it sure. in order to you know to get the notifications. But hopefully people are used to that by now with most of the apps that they download. You have to. Say it's okay, you know, For to sure. send notifications. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Um, any board questions for today? Um, any public comment on the meeting? Okay. Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>